Hey everyone, and the VC is Matt again, and so I just did a review of Carl and the Passions by the Beach Boys, working through their catalog slowly but surely, but I thought I would uh, do another video today at a change of pace, finish off the Beatles, I've been going through the Beatles albums in order of release, and just sort of uh, listing the songs on the album in order of my preference from top to bottom, or bottom to top actually, and so anyway, we did a... Uh, I did, not we, I did Abbey Road yesterday, and so that brings us to the uh, the last uh, Beatles album. And the thing keeps popping over, hey, you keep getting in there. Which is not actually the last Beatles album, because Abbey Road is technically the last Beatles album, because it was recorded after this, but this came out after Abbey Road, because they held it for a while, and didn't know what to do with it, so this is sort of the last Beatles album, but not really the last Beatles album, you get all that good. All right, so let it be. And I pulled this one because my uh, this was kind of near and dear to my heart, even though it's not in the best of shape. This is my original copy from back in the '70s that I got when I was about nine or ten years old. I remember this and introducing the Beatles when I first got into the Beatles back in '73. These were on sale at a store called Treasure City, which was kind of like a cut-rate version of Kmart in the hood. But uh, these were, I think, a dollar ninety-nine a piece, and so my mom and dad took me out there to buy "Let It Be" and "Introducing the Beatles." Sadly, I don't have my copy of "Introducing the Beatles" anymore. But so, yeah, for buck ninety-nine, which I mean, nineteen seventy-three, even probably still a fairly good price because I think albums were about five or six bucks by that time, maybe four or five bucks. So uh, this one I've had all these years. I've got better copies of this, but. Uh, I like it. It's got the red apple on the back. I think the uh, British one, I should have pulled that to compare it. I think it has uh, either no apple or a green apple. It also, I didn't know for years that the British version didn't have the gatefold. It's just a single album, just this. And uh, I didn't know that till just, just a few years ago, actually. Of course, in England, they had the uh, original initial copies came in the box set with the books, and those go for a fortune now and I'd like to get one of those someday. But, uh, so yeah, this is my original copy. I also like, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see that, but they're on the uh, spine. You might notice there's nothing on there. And this is a pretty worn out copy, but uh, the album was pressed off uh, center, so it's actually on the back of the album, which should be on the spine. And inside, and I think the British one had a green apple too, I'm not sure, but of course in America had the red apple, and uh, this album's, album's still in good shape, but the uh, sleeve and all is somewhat falling apart, so anyway, uh, yeah, this one sort of got a bad, uh, uh, bad reviews and a bad, bad uh, uh, shape when it first came out, remember the, uh, Tony Tyler and Roy Carr illustrated Beatles book. They called this the card, cardboard two stone to the world's greatest band or something like that. And this was seen as uh, uh, just not a very good album and a step back for the Beatles. Uh, in in years since, it's been uh, reevaluated somewhat, much like Ram when that came out got all or got a lot of bad reviews in the press and has since been. Uh, Reevaluated to be considered one of Paul's best, if not his best solo album. This certainly no one's gonna mistake this for the Beatles' best album, but I always liked it from day one. I've always had a soft spot for it, and truth be told, and this is gonna uh, probably not gonna have too many people share this opinion. I actually like this album better than I like Abbey Road. Uh, now Abbey Road has the medley, which is which is. Uh, which is brilliant and great, and there's nothing, there's nothing comparable to that on here. But I'm just saying, overall, I like this because there's really, maybe one exception. There's really no nothing on here that I don't like. Uh, this has always been one of my favorite cold, rainy day albums. Anytime it rains, I always uh, have this on CD. Of course, I like to play it in the car when I'm out driving around and going to work on a rainy morning, and. Uh, Cold Winter Days and Rainy Spring Days. This has always been my go-to album. And uh, I can remember uh, my grandparents, uh, when they uh, 
retired. They moved from Fort Worth up to Oklahoma, to Lake Texoma. We go up to see them on the weekends, and, and uh, this album always uh, is like a two-hour, two-and-a-half-hour car ride. This album, for whatever reason, always kind of played through my head when I was a little kid going up there riding in my parents' car. Um, so, yeah, I've always been a fan of this, and um, while it's not their best album, it's certainly, certainly not their worst, and they really didn't make any bad albums anyway, so... Uh, so it's another one where rating these songs is kind of difficult, uh, more difficult than it was on Abbey Road for me because there's nothing on here that I really don't like, even though when I was younger there were a couple of these that I didn't, wasn't crazy about that I've since come to like. Um, I think it's a shame that they didn't have uh, um, maybe Old Brown Shoe and Don't Let Me Down on here. That might have made the album stronger. But thankfully, they didn't have you know my name look up my number on here because that's uh, that and um, Wild Honey Pyre, in my opinion, the Beatles' two worst songs ever. So I'm glad that's not here. But anyway, there's 12 songs on here, and we'll go from number 12 up to number one. Uh, it was uh, May 8th, 1970. If I didn't already say, is when this came out, and naturally it hit number one in England and in America and. A lot of other places in the world, I'm sure. Uh, it's also a movie. Oh, the movie I remember watching uh, was really cool when I first got into the Beatles around 73. It's uh, These things kind of happen that, uh, I don't know, a week, a month, pretty soon after, when I still didn't have all their albums, didn't know all the songs, didn't even know you know, who was who yet in the Beatles. I remember, like, is that John? Is, is, is that George? Is that Paul? I mean, I didn't have this album yet, but uh, some of the albums of my brothers. Uh, so A Hard Day's Night showed up on TV on the afternoon movie. Not Hard Day's Night, Help did. That's the first one I saw. Uh, still my favorite Beatles movie, even though Hard Day's Night is the better movie. But I love Hard Day's Night. But so I remember Help and Hard Day's Night showing up on TV mm, once or twice a year. Yellow Submarine show up a couple of times a year. This was never on TV, at least not for work that I know of. And of course, when this was out at the movie theaters in, I guess, 1970, I, you know, was six, so I didn't go see it. Um, but yeah, I finally got to see the movie at uh, midnight movie. I remember I was probably 12 or 13, and kind of had to talk to my parents and let me go to a midnight movie, which they weren't that thrilled about. But I finally just begged and pleaded and wore them down, went to see it at the TCU Theater, and then I saw it at, uh, went to a couple of Beatle Fests later in 78 and 81, of course they were playing it there, but um, I remember this being out on videotape very early on when video stores first started popping up around 80, 81, and I guess there was some legal whatever and it went out of print pretty quick and hadn't been sent, so I've got a bootleg copy on DVD that's fairly good quality, but hopefully they'll release the movie sometime, because it's been a long time since I've seen it. So let's get to the songs. Uh, Twelve songs, we'll start with number twelve. Number twelve for me is The Long and Winding Road. I don't know, the song sometimes, rarely, but once in a blue moon I'm in the mood for it and like it okay. Most of the time it's just sort of a dreary, slow, weary dirge of a song. It's um, it's like a fourth rate, hey Jude and let it be. It's like Paul went to that same same creative well that he went to for hey Jude and let it be, thinking he was going to pull another gym out and he pulled the long and winding road. And I know there's all the controversy about how this was originally supposed to sound and how it sounded after Phil Spector got hold of the tapes and remixed them and arranged them and so forth and uh, but either version uh, I've never been crazy about the song it, it, it works sometimes I just have to be in the mood for it and I rarely am uh, it's it's just not a terrible song I guess if I was to rate it on a scale of 1 to 10 I'd probably give it a 6 maybe but um, Paul's done better and I think it's just a lazy man's let it be or hey Jude uh, it, it's okay. Number 11, uh, and from here on out, I, I, I like most everything. There's one other song that I'm on, but number 11 is Maggie May, which is a old public domain song, an old uh, folk song or something that they do. 
first time they'd done a cover in, in quite a while. Uh, a little snippet of a song, it's kind of a goofy sing-along, like a barroom sing-along song. Um, not much to it, but always it's, it's um, I don't know, it's enjoyable, it's kind of fun in its own way. Uh, they probably had fun singing it. Uh, it's kind of something like in the vein of All Together Now or one of those type deals, but nothing nothing major, but, but uh, it, I don't know, I, it's just kind of fun, I like it. Number 10 is Dig It. Um, there's on uh, I've Got Bootlegs where there's like a, what, a five, six minute version of that song, uh, which doesn't really improve the song. It's a little snippet, but um, on the album, uh, I like the way it comes before and, and leads into Let It Be. Uh, it's kind of a rambling mess of a song. A junk song, really. But again, like, like Maggie Mae, it's, it's I like it. It's just short and sweet and passes by, and it's kind of, I don't know, funny, but it's just, just a fun little goofy song. And for what it is, I've always enjoyed it. Number nine, Get Back. The uh, hit single, well, one of the two hit singles off the, well, one of the three, because Long and Winding Road was a single in the U.S. Um, yeah, it's the Beatles trying to get back to basics. I mean, because this section, I think the single came out like a year or so before this album, and um, it's um, it's kind of a generic rock song. It's it's not. It's uh, I know it's it's a favorite of many, and it's a huge hit, and it was number one and all. But to me, it, the Beatles have done a lot better, and it's not. It's it's a good song, but it's not up to Beatles standards. And uh, it, I like it. It's it's kind of like the Long and Winding Road. I like it more than that, but it's one of those to have to be in the mood for, and sometimes. I'm in the mood for it. Most of the time, I'm not. Uh, number eight, For You, Blue, one of George's two songs on here. He had brought quite a few of the songs in that um, ended up on All Things Must Pass subsequently, but they didn't, and the Beatles did some ver versions of some of those songs, but they didn't show a whole lot of interest, and so he kind of got discouraged and just saved them for his first, or, well, really third solo album, All Things Must Pass. Uh, so we ended up bringing in um, For You Blue and another song we'll get to in a minute. Um, when I was little, I thought it was kind of a, uh, just a dull, not a very good song. As I've gotten older, it's, and the other George song have grown on me. I didn't, didn't, was never really crazy about either one of them when I was little. And I like a lot of the George songs in the Beatles, I like most of them. Uh, but these two I was not nuts about, but they've grown on me as, as the years go by. And so that comes in at number eight for you, Blue. Number seven is um, actually the next George song, I Me Mine. like that just a little bit better than for you, Blue. I really quite like it now, and it's not as good as uh, his songs on the White Album. It's not as good as his songs on All Things Must Pass, neither of these, but but uh, like I said, they've, they've grown on me, and I like them a lot more than I used to. Number six is I Dig a Pony, which is a pretty crappy linen song. I like the delivery. I like the performance. Lyrically, it's kind of silly. It's something he probably tossed off. Uh, he was a little bit out of it through a lot of this uh, for various and sundry reasons, and his songs are, with a few exceptions, not the strongest here. Uh, I Dig a Pony's not a great song, but I, I don't know, it, it, uh, it's placement on the album works, maybe if it was some place somewhere else in the, in the order of the songs of the album, it wouldn't work as well. I, I just, I always liked it. Uh, number five is the title track, Let It Be. Uh, really like the song, but sometimes it's another one that I've got to be in the mood to listen to. It's, uh, uh it's not as good as Hey Jude, which is sort of in that fashion of a song, uh, but it's such it's, it's a good song. I, I love the uh, guitar solo. Uh, I guess there's really a couple of them from George in this, and uh, piano and vocal by Paul is really good. Lyrics are um, pretty good. Um, I don't know. It, it's just a great song. I just sometimes I'm not in the mood to listen to it, which is rare for a Beatles song for me. Number four, song that they originally did way back in their early days, uh, that they revived for this one after 909, 
love the guitar, um, the guitar, I love the piano, I love the singing, maybe it's keyboards, but piano keyboards, the singing, it's just a very spirited and rousing and rollicking performance, uh, full of energy, uh, vote, uh, lyrically is not that much of a song, but I just always liked it. Number three, Across the Universe, John's best song here, and uh, just uh, uh, kind of a kind of one of the last of the uh, sort of psychedelic songs maybe from him uh, unless you count number nine dream years later but uh, just a really good uh, late late period Beatle Lennon song I don't know what else to say about it it's just a great song uh, number two is two of us and uh, number one is I've got a feeling and I could really just flip flop those all day long because it's pretty much a tie for number one on both those songs. I just love those songs. I mean, it's, uh, this is the album where the Beatles aren't really growing artistically or breaking new ground like they had been through their whole career. It's a step back. It's just a get back to basics type album, which, uh, you know, bands like The Band and, and, uh, Dylan with, uh, John Wesley Harden and, and, um, um, oh, uh, you know, uh, Nashville Skyline was doing sort of these type of things too around this time. So it's not a progressive or a step forward album, it's just a sort of step back and back to the basics album. But that always worked for me in a certain way. And uh, even though this album is not considered their best by probably anyone, it's always uh, it's always been now my love. And uh, really I think if anyone else but the Beatles had recorded this album, it would have been hailed as a masterpiece. It's just because it was the Beatles and it took some flack when it first came out, by critics at least. And I just went to number one, like I said, so I don't know, maybe the fans loved it too, but um, I don't think anyone thought this was better than Sgt. Pepper or, uh, you know, Rubber Soul or whatever, but but it's a great album. Uh, scale of 1 to 10, it's still, it gets a 10 for me. And uh, so there you go. I was thinking maybe that does the Beatles, maybe taking the uh, Past Masters album and ranking those songs in order, but I'm not sure if I want to do that just because the songs come from the whole span of a Beatles career, so it's kind of weird to be ranking Thank You Girl against um, Lady Madonna or something, so I don't know if I'll do that or not. But anyway, hope everyone's having a good weekend. We'll talk to you later.